great to have our brother Joshua again uh, with us this evening. We're just going to hand over to Joshua now. Thank you, Joshua. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you once again, and this is the last of our studies. It's hard to believe that we're into April in a couple of days' time. Uh, the month has flown through, and I just trust that uh, this uh, month of Tuesday nights has been as much a blessing to you as it has been even to me in its preparation. And so we're coming once again to Ephesians chapter 6 in the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6. We've covered most of the armour already, and this evening we're just coming to the last two parts of it. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll read together from the verse 14. And the word of God says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. And we trust the Lord will indeed bless the reading of his word to our hearts this evening. There was someone once called the Pilgrim's Progress, the 1984 of Christian literature, in that a number of people claim to have read it, but in reality, they haven't. I'm in the process of reading it, so I'm in both camps at the minute. And in one point of the, the, the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, the character Christian finds himself in combat with a monster or a dragon by the name of Apollyon. And he seems to be on the ropes whenever Apollyon says to him, I am sure of thee now. And with that, it says in the book here, with that, he had almost pressed him to death. So that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching of his last blow to make a full end of this man, Christian nimbly stretched out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And with that gave him a deadly thrust which made him give way. And with that Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped away that Christian for a season saw him no more. It was a wonderful allegory, it's a wonderful illustration that John Bunyan uses, not just for this instance, but for all the different scenarios believers find themselves in. And this particular one, covering the theme we've been looking at of spiritual warfare and, and the enemy fighting against believers. And we saw in that little episode that the Christian's weapon of choice against this monster, against this dragon who was going against him and was at almost the point of death, as it were, Christian's weapon of choice was the spirit, or was the sword of the spirit. And that quote that he says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. That's a lot more than a, a little motivational quote to have a go at the enemy, but it's a direct quote from Micah uh, chapter 7 and the verse 8. So Christian's choice was not only to use the sword of the spirit, uh, perhaps in a spiritual sense, but referring that sword of the spirit to the word of God and even using the word of God to stand against the enemy. And that's why that's the first uh, piece of armour we're looking at this evening at the end of the verse 17. The sword of the spirit which is uh, the word of God. And Paul turns our attention to this piece of spiritual armour that we can use it uh, both as a form of attack and as a form of defence in the day of battle. So whenever we think of attacking in the spiritual in spiritual warfare whenever we think of attacking we're brought here to the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and as we've been looking at all these different pieces of the armor of god over the last few weeks we've really seen the emphasis on how it is a spiritual battle that yes there may be physical elements sometimes and there may be times where we feel uh, physical results of uh, the battle as well as spiritual effects uh, and injuries uh, sometimes after the days of battle but primarily it is a spiritual uh, battleground it's a spiritual warfare it's a spiritual aspect of battle and of defense and even right until uh, the end here of Paul's teaching it's all about the Lord himself it's all about the spirit 
and the sword of the Spirit that's mentioned here, which is the Word of God. And again, we've been thinking of uh, the different pieces of the armor Paul uses and and addressing them to what it would have uh, meant to the Roman soldier back then, what the believers in Ephesus even would have known of the physical aspects as well. They would have known what the Roman soldier used them for, how the Roman soldier would have dressed. And whenever we think of the sword of the spirit, uh, it's something quite uh, quite simple. There's nothing... uh, allegorical about it there's nothing extra spiritual to think about it it is just a simple sword that you would picture in your mind something that was uh, very razor sharp something that uh, wasn't blunt whenever you whenever you made contact with somebody it caused damage it didn't just leave a bruise it doesn't just leave a bit of a mark but it would have caused a very a deep wound it was something that was sharp it was something that was accessible he didn't have it you know, taped to his back and he was spending a lot of time trying to get the sword off his back. But he had it uh, almost right at his, at his right hand, right at his disposal. So that whenever the enemy uh, came into sight, uh, as soon as he needed that weapon, he was able to draw it and have it faced against the enemy uh, as soon as he even saw the enemy a- approaching. We think of it being sharp, being accessible, uh, uh, and in the same sense being quick, not only to reach, but very quick to use. Uh, it wouldn't have been awfully heavy for the Roman soldier. It wasn't something uh, that was so uh, heavy and that, that had a lot of weight to it that the soldier would have found it a struggle to use. But he trained himself in its use. And so he was able to use it quickly. He wasn't in a, in a kerfuffle. He wasn't worried or stressed about how it was going to work on the day of battle. He was well trained in the use of that sword. And he was able to use it quickly and use it to great effect. Now again, Paul doesn't use the idea of a sword to emphasize the word of God just out of the blue. But whenever we think about the word of God, how itself is something that's sharp, how it's accessible, how it's quick. Even the writer to the Hebrews in a verse that many of us know just sums it up so wonderfully and so powerfully, how the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now here we're thinking of something that's sharp, something that's decisive. Something that doesn't just leave minimal impact, but something that leaves a mark, spiritually speaking. Something that causes somebody to think about things. Something that that causes hurt sometimes. Something that causes unease and discomfort at times whenever it's necessary. Not only though is the word of God sharp, but again we think of it as being accessible. Here we have it here in our own language this evening. How it is in the plan and in the will of God for all nations to come to understand the wonderful works of God. You know, whenever God first called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees and that wonderful promise that he gives to Abraham, he says, through thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And that ultimate promise came in that promised seed of Abraham whenever the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was born and how he was crucified and died for the sins of many. And how us in Ballyclare this evening have been blessed through the promise given to Abraham. How we're included amongst all nations of the world this evening. We have the word of God here. We have the great blessings of God for us this evening. Uh, Something that's accessible uh, to us. We can turn uh, very easily to us. Every one of us, uh, I'm sure, has a copy of the word of God at home. Uh, Some of us even have more than one copy. We have uh, copies of it on our phones or your your tablets or whatever else you have. Uh, There's a copy of it everywhere. It's so uh, accessible for us this evening. And then we think of it being quick uh, as well. How whenever we come to the word of God and whenever we read uh, those verses that stick out to us, it's just as if they hit us right between the eyes. How there's those things, uh, whether it's great words of promise and great words uh, of blessing that encourage us and we get that that warmth and that that feeling of the love and the care of God straight away. Or whether it's those words of challenge, uh, those words of, of correction that again make us uncomfortable straight away. And as much as as we might try and and hide their impact, we understand really in the depths of our hearts that God is speaking to us. It's something that's quick. It's not something that we read and then uh, the truth of it only seems to seep through over a matter of weeks or a matter of months, but it's very direct. And it's something that's very bold. So again, Paul doesn't use uh, this idea of the sword by chance, but how the word of God really is a sword. 
how it is sharp, how it's accessible, how it's quick in its delivery. But whenever we think of, of the sword itself, and yes, we're thinking about attack this evening in terms of, of combating our, our spiritual enemy. We looked at the example of Christian there against uh, uh, Apollyon. But it's not only used for attack, but it's also used for defense. Whenever you see those, those great combat scenes and, and they use the sword to block the, the other blow from the enemy, it's not only used in attack to progress, but it's used in defense as well to stop the blows of the enemy. You know, again, whenever it comes to the word of God, it's not just that we use it in times of attack. We don't just turn to the word of God whenever we find ourselves in difficult situations and we want to know uh, what it is God wants us to do or we find ourselves in troublesome situations and we want to know the answer so that we could use it against Satan. It's not just in days of attack, but it's also in days of defense that we can use uh, the word of God. Now again, whenever we think of those times where uh, we're tempted, we have uh, those doubts that come into our heads. We looked at it last week about our salvation. Whenever Satan tries to distress us and tries to discourage us uh, and throws those fiery darts of doubt uh, uh, and, and confusion about our standing before the Lord, about how much the Lord loves us, about how much uh, we're saved, how we can raise up uh, the sword of the Spirit, how we can raise up the Word of God as a form of defense. And throw back the word of God at Satan and remind him that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So it's not only a form of attack, but it's also a form of defense as well. And Paul here talks about having and taking that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Again, Paul emphasizes the spiritual aspect, but here he emphasizes the word of God as well it's a, it's only the, it's one of the few times here if not the only time where paul uh, uses a, an example of of the armor of god and gives a, a detailed uh, description behind it the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and again paul emphasizes here the word of god emphasizes here this evening uh, that the spirit and the word is never to be separated it's not just a sword of the spirit on its own but it's the sword of the spirit which is the word of God the spirit of God and the word of God can never be separated because both of them are vital to our lives as believers this evening even whenever we think of the work of the spirit of God and the word of God how it's intertwined how the word of God is inspired by the spirit of God himself remember what Paul says to Timothy all scripture is given by inspiration of God is in the in its fuller sense it's it's breathed out by God it's given by inspiration of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's in, it was even in the very work of the Word of God being put into place. So the Spirit of God and the Word of God cannot be separated. Whenever we come to the Word of God, we come in the Spirit of the Lord. But whenever again, even whenever we think of, of using this, this sword of the Spirit, whenever we think of, of using it, as the word of God. Sometimes we can, we can come to it. In just the one aspect. We can come to it. In the sight of the spirit. Without truly understanding it is the word of God. Or we can come to it. As the word of God. Without uh, truly understanding the spiritual aspect. Of it as well. And we can come to the word of God. Sometimes unknowingly and, and ignorantly. But, but still we can come to it at times. As some sort of a good luck charm. Whenever things aren't going our way and we find ourselves in troubled situations, we can very easily turn to the word of God and turn to our favorite verses, turn to our favorite passages. But sometimes without truly knowing it, we're using it as a good luck charm. Maybe with the mindset of, well, I used this verse in this way before and God bless me with that, I'll use it again and see what happens. Unknowingly, we can do that uh, as believers sometimes. You know, there was an episode in, in the Old Testament whenever, uh, just before Saul was king, and the people of Israel were fighting uh, the Philistines on the first day. There were 4,000 killed. They went out to battle again. Uh, another 10,000 were killed. And the people were so confused as to what was going on. And they came together and they said, let us get the Ark of the Covenant that it may save us from the hand of our enemies. They weren't trusting in the, in the Lord. They were trusting in the Ark. And the Ark of the Covenant, yes, it was a symbol of the presence of God. And it was a symbol of the glory of God. But they were using it as some sort of a good luck charm. They trusted in the Ark of God rather than the God of the Ark. 
And as much as we have the word of God this evening, sometimes we have to be careful that we're not just trusting in the words themselves, but that we're trusting the God that gave us those words in the first place. You know, Paul reminds us here of the importance of the Spirit at work as well in the Word of God. So then whenever we, we think of the sword of the Spirit in action, whenever we think of how we have the sword of the Spirit, just exactly what all it entails, how do we put that into practice whenever we find ourselves in those days where we need it? Well, again, we're brought to the realization that we cannot face our enemy ourselves. We can't stand against the wiles of the devil ourselves. We can't uh, quench the fiery darts of the wicked ourselves. We looked at last week how we needed uh, the shield of faith for that. We were reminded as well that we're resting against uh, principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And throughout all these things, we're, we're shown how vital each piece of this armor of God is to our daily walk with the Lord. And the sword of the Spirit is nothing different. And so we need it as we find ourselves in dark and these very difficult days. Well, there's three main ways that the word of God can be used, both as a form of defense and as a form of attack in these days we find ourselves in. First of all, we think of it as a form of, of defense stroke attack in some sense. Whenever we think about, we've already briefly mentioned, that those times where Satan tries to have a go, whenever those doubts come in, where those trials come in, even whenever those moments of temptation come into our lives, how we need to turn to the sword of the Spirit, how we need to turn to the Word of God to fight against what it is Satan uh, tries to do with us. You know, that was the downfall of Adam and Eve. Whenever Satan came to them and he twisted the Word of God, he tempted them to take of, of the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Eve, it seemed, wasn't very grounded in the Word of God. She added something extra to the command God gave them, how God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit, and Eve told Satan, we can't eat it, and we can't even touch it either. There was some misunderstanding in the word of God. She wasn't able to, to trust it fully, she wasn't able to understand it fully, and then we see the fall. And even whenever we, we comb through the word of God, we see how the word of God is used by others in this fight against temptation, and notably Christ himself. How even the Son of God, even the Messiah, used the Word of God. Used this sword of the Spirit as he fought against temptation. Remember after his baptism and he was out in the wilderness fasting and Satan came along and, and, and challenged him, if you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And Jesus answered, it is written. And points him back to the Old Testament. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not just in the first instance does he, do, does he do it, but the other two instances that follow as well. Each time Satan tempted Christ, he always answered Christ back with scripture and always brought him back to the word of God because as we've seen already this evening, the word of God is quick, it is powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can do the job that you and I can't do ourselves. It can cause that hurt. It, can re it itself can resist the devil that he may flee. So whenever we think of how Christ himself wielded the sword of the spirit, whenever Christ himself used the word of God to fight against those moments of temptation, how much more should you and I this evening? How much more should you and I trust in his word to fight against those moments of temptation, even against those moments of doubt that come in? Those moments whenever it seems that the word of God is twisted. Whenever Satan tries to have a go. How we can know this evening. We can trust in the word of God. It was good enough for the saviour to rely on. To get him through those moments of temptation. And without being irreverent this evening. If it was good enough for the Lord. Then surely it's good enough for you and for me. How we can trust in the sword of the spirit. Christ showed us it's effective in those moments of temptation and so we can rely it whenever we find ourselves in those moments of temptation but we don't only use it whenever we fight against temptation but even whenever we're fighting for truth as well again we find ourselves in a day and in an age where the word of god is challenged constantly even amongst professing churches it's twisted constantly and they don't really know where they stand. And so whenever believers are faced with those things, what is it we do? What is it that we do? Well, we come once again to the word of God. 
compare scripture with scripture we're told and see where it is the truth lies remember remember John says to believe not every spirit but to try the spirit test the spirits to see whether they be of God even Paul himself as he went on his missionary journeys it says in Acts 17 Paul as his manner was went unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures alleging that Christ must needs suffer you know, Paul always brought it back to the word of God in the progression of truth in the progression of the gospel he didn't rely on his own understanding he didn't rely on his own knowledge or his own wisdom to try and explain the work of the cross. He didn't try and use his own ideas to try and explain what it was that Jesus had done for them. But he reasoned out of the scriptures that Christ must needs have suffered. Now, there's a lover, or somebody changed uh, the children's chorus to make it say wonderful things in the Bible I see. And most of them put there by you and by me. Sometimes we can force our own ideas into scripture without knowing that they were never there in the first place. There's some things, even some hymns that we can sing that aren't necessarily uh, biblically accurate uh, fully. And so we always have to base what it is we believe and what it is we praise the Lord for out of the word of God. How we need to bring it back and use the sword of the spirit, use the word of God in those days. How we have to trust in him and trust what it is that he says trust what it is that God says whenever it comes to those days whenever we're fighting against uh, the truth that's being twisted and we're fighting against the lies of the devil but not only against temptation not only uh, as a form of truth uh, but even in terms of our our gospel witness and in terms of our gospel outreach whenever we think of evangelism and speaking to others around about us how we so desperately need the sword of the spirit which is once again the word of God uh, and we've thought about how it is quick how it leaves a mark how it's something that's very direct and something that's very bold and we can all testify this evening that it certainly was whenever we first heard it how whenever we were first uh, brought under uh, conviction of sin how it pierced us how it hurt us uh, that we were we were shown in that moment that we were far from God and that we were destined for a lost sinner's hell but it was the word of God that spoke to us it wasn't the emotion of mankind, it wasn't the words of mankind or the ideas of mankind, but it was the word of God that pierced our hearts and pierced our souls and brought us to the Saviour. That's what he does for all sinners who are still outside of Christ. He uses the word of God to draw mankind onto salvation. You know, Again, that verse in Romans chapter 10, Paul explains, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How it's the sword of the spirit that's used even in those moments of evangelism whenever we share the wonderful things that Jesus Christ has done. How it, ought, how it always ought to be based on the word of God. How it's the sword of the spirit that's to be used in those days. You know, as we've looked over the last few weeks at how these days of, of battle aren't optional that they are always part of the Christian walk and not all of us are going to face the same battles but we're going to be on the same uh, battleground so it is with evangelism as well you know it's not something that uh, that just some of God's people are called to do and not just those who are behind the pulpit or those who go out to to foreign lands or or whatever else it may be but every single child of God is to be involved in this as well and so whenever we think of the sword of the spirit being used in this way again as something that every child of God is to be involved in you know Timothy whenever Paul wrote to Timothy Timothy was to to be a future uh, pastor as we would call it a future uh, leading and teaching elder but even though that was to be his role Paul told him do the work of an evangelist now, the evangelist was a different a role, a different office. It's not something Timothy was called to, but Paul still tells him, do the work of an evangelist. Even though you're not meant to be doing it out and out, there's still a work for you to do. And even though the Lord may call you and I this evening to different uh, positions, the Lord may call you and I this evening to different places, there's still a charge for you and I this evening to do the work of an evangelist. And to do that, we need the word of God. Because again... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
We see the sword of the Spirit in action there whenever we think of attacking. And then just as we close this evening, we think of advocating as well. That brings us to the verse 18. Uh, and in some sense, uh, this is where we see all of this being put together. In verse 18, Paul says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. No, again, even here, we're reminded that once again, it's a spiritual battle. Because we're brought to the place of prayer. And even then, we're praying in the spirit, as Paul says. How it's a spiritual battleground. Yes, there might be physical effects at times, but it's still a spiritual battleground. It's a spiritual warfare, and it's a warfare that's fought through spiritual means. You know, yes, there are things we, we have to do physically. Yes, there are some practical things that are involved. You know, whenever we think of that, that, those times that we're tempted, and again, that wonderful verse of assurance that, Paul, uh, that, that God gives us in 1 Corinthians, how whenever we do find ourselves in temptations, uh, that we're not tempted beyond uh, what we're, we're able to bear, but that God will provide a means of escape and it's us it's for us to to go out that way of escape it's for us to avoid that moment of temptation and to escape that way of temptation yes there's practical things and physical things that we can do but at the end of the day our main aim and our main thing to do in spiritual battle is to bring it before the lord and find ourselves in fellowship with him praying always with all prayer and supplication. You know, David said in First Chronicles uh, chapter 16, Glory ye in his name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. You now again, thinking of those times, uh, not only whenever we find ourselves in times of blessing, and times of encouragement, whenever things are going well, it's not just then that we need to seek the Lord. And even in times of trouble, it's not just then that we need to seek the Lord. But how it's in all times here, David emphasized it. Seek the Lord, seek his face continually. Paul says here, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Whenever it comes to those days of spiritual fight and those days of spiritual battle, we don't go out in our own strength. As much as we have the armor of God on, as much as we know the spiritual aspects of it, we don't go out in our own strength. But we always bring it back to him, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Again, the life and the ministry of Christ is a wonderful example of how much prayer is involved in those days, not only of ministry, but in those days of trouble and those days of temptation as well. And as you go through the whole ministry of Christ, we see that prayer was a vital part of his life and of his ministry. That, that personal prayer time between him and the Father and the Spirit as well. How it was vital to him and to his ministry. You know, even at the beginning of his ministry, whenever he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him, it says, Jesus being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Spirit descended like a dove. Even before he, he picked his twelve uh, disciples, it says he went on to a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. You know, this wasn't something that, that Jesus took lightly. Even though, yes, he did come as God in the flesh, he still relied on prayer. He still showed us this evening the need for prayer in all aspects of our lives. Even before he, 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 he practiced miracles, before he walked on the Sea of Galilee, it says he went up into a mountain to pray after times of, of what you might call intense ministry whenever he was uh, surrounded by the multitudes and, and he was healing uh, multitudes of people and he was preaching to multitudes of people after those moments it says he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed and then of course we think of that moment where he was under great pressure and great stress in that, uh, that hour in Gethsemane even then he prayed as well, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And even beyond Gethsemane, even on the cross, he still prayed to the Father. Remember the different cries that he prayed, not only for himself, but even for others round about him. Even praying for the ones that nailed him there. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
And even at his moment of death, he prayed to the Father, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, through every aspect of the ministry of Christ, prayer was vital to him. And again, if prayer was vital to him, how much more should prayer be vital to you and to me this evening? You know, the illustration, or the suppose the truth rather, is often said that the prayer meeting is the, the least attended meeting among the people of God. If you were to have a week of meetings on prophecy, the place would maybe be bunged out. If you had a week of meetings on, on last days or even perhaps spiritual gifts in some places, you wouldn't get a seat. But whenever it comes to the prayer meeting, there's not many, not many put themselves forward to be there early. You know, Christ teaches those that claim to follow him how vital prayer is not only in days of spiritual battle, but even for our everyday walk with him. For those things that we find ourselves involved with for him. You know how much we truly need to depend on him. You know, Jesus sent the disciples out one time to perform miracles and to preach about the kingdom of heaven uh, being at hand, how uh, they needed to repent. There was another time where the disciples tried to cast out uh, demons and devils and they couldn't. For whatever reason, they lacked unbelief. And Jesus was able to do it and the disciples were confused. Why could we not do this? And Jesus said it was because of their lack of faith. And he gives that illustration about having faith the size of a mustard seed. How even that can cause great things. But even after that Jesus says this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. You know, how much prayer was needed for the ministry of the disciples as well. If it's vital for the ministry of Christ, for the ministry of the disciples. Again it's vital for us this evening. How we desperately need to spend that time in prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Again Paul emphasizes just how vital prayer is. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Again not just in those moments where we find ourselves in spiritual battle. Not just in those moments where we find ourselves under the pressure. In those moments of temptation or trial or discouragement. But praying always. With all prayer and supplication. Again that, that covers all aspects of our Christian life. In those times where we find ourselves filled with joy. And rejoicing and on the spiritual mountain top as it were. How then we need to be in prayer. Whether it's even to give thanks to the Lord for the great things that he's done. And for the great blessings that he's given to us. Even uh, whenever we're in the valley. How we need to pray to the Lord for his help. And for his strength. And even whenever we're on the plain. Whenever we're neither up nor down. How we need to be praying to the Lord. To sustain us. And to continue to lead us in the way. He would have us to go. You know, as we thought over the last few weeks. At uh, the different ways Satan can have a go at us. Now, remember we looked last week at how. Uh, Satan's attacks can be spontaneous. How they can sometimes uh, come out of the blue. Whenever we least expect them. We thought of the fiery darts that are uh, sort of like the guerrilla tactics whenever they, they come out of nowhere and just try to cause as much damage uh, as possible before something else happens. We saw then that Satan can be spontaneous. Satan uh, can, uh, can come whenever we least expect it. He can come very quickly. And so if that's the case, then, as Paul says here, we always need to be in prayer. We always need to be in fellowship with the Lord. Since Satan can attack unawares now again it's not only here that that paul mentions this this continual sense of prayer in first thessalonians remember he says pray without ceasing in romans he says rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation continuing instant in prayer you know, paul had his own testimony he had those experiences where he was under pressure where he found himself under spiritual pressure even physical pressure as well and how he realized he needed the lord he needed to be in prayer he needed to be in fellowship with the lord at all times because we're not aware when satan will come with those fiery darts we're unaware when satan will try and get us with those doubts and with those temptations but again it's not always in these days of battle just uh, not just in these days of battle uh, but it is particularly at these moments of battle 
particularly at these moments when we find ourselves on our knees physically, how we need to come before the Lord. You know, David, uh, again, found himself uh, surrounded by enemies. He had plenty of them. He had plenty of instances where he found himself under pressure and facing opposition. And in Psalm 61, this is what he cries out uh, during those times. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. You know, David found himself in the day of battle, both physical and spiritual, as Satan tried not only to disrupt the people of God, but to disrupt that promised line of the Saviour. But even then, David trusted in the Lord. And he brought that moment he found himself into the Lord. And trusted in him to be his defence, to be his shelter. And trusting that the Lord would carry him out the other side. Now again, a, a striking reminder to us this evening how vital prayer is for each and every one of us. Particularly in those moments of battle. Do you trust him this evening? Whenever your heart is overwhelmed, do you cry to be led to the rock that's higher than you and I? Do you trust in him to undertake? Do you try and fight your own way out? Do you try and rely on yourself? How we can truly uh, come before him in those moments, knowing that not only is he willing to answer prayer, but he's able to answer prayer as well. Praying always, here Paul says, as we think of advocating in these days of spiritual battle, praying always with all prayer and supplication. You know that phrase Paul uses there, with all prayer and supplication. You know, again, it's a reminder of, of the various opportunities that we as God's people have to come before him in prayer. How we're not uh, limited to any particular time. We're not limited to any particular location. Uh, we're not limited at, at whatever different limitations some other religions may have or even some of God's people might put in front of themselves. But how we can pray always with all prayer and supplication. And again, as you go through the word of God, you see the different opportunities we as God's people have to come before him in prayer. We think of, of private prayer, uh, first of all, and those, those wonderful teachings of Christ in Matthew chapter 6, how he tells us to pray uh, not as the hypocrites and, and not as the religious leaders out in public for show, uh, not just to show off uh, all those things. Jesus says they have their reward, but he says to pray in secret, go into your closet, close the door. And pray to your Father in secret. And the Father that sees in secret shall reward thee openly. You know, how we have a sweet sense of private and personal fellowship with the Lord. How whenever we can come before him. And as far as the rest of the world is concerned it doesn't matter. Because it's just us and God. We can think of, of private prayer. We can think of corporate prayer. Whenever we find ourselves among the believers of God. Whenever Peter was in prison. And it says they went to the house of Mary in Acts chapter 12. It says many were gathered to pray. How the early church understood the importance of having corporate prayer as well as private prayer. How they needed to come together to pray as well. So that they could unite and fellowship one with another. And come before the Lord as a church body. Think of private prayer, corporate prayer. Even silent prayer is mentioned as well. We think of Hannah. In First Samuel uh, chapter 1, whenever she was praying uh, privately, it says she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice wasn't heard. And even though her voice wasn't physically heard, God still heard her prayer. God still heard her, even though there was no words that came out. How even silent prayer can be heard by God himself. And there's many of God's people who do come to prayer meetings and they have burdens on their hearts that they can't even bring before other believers. And they just pray within themselves and pray silently. And dear believer, if that's your case this evening, know that your silent prayers are heard just as much as the public ones. Don't be discouraged. Don't think that those prayers are, are further down the line to be answered. God hears every one of them, whether it's audible 
or whether it's silent. There's private prayer, there's corporate prayer, there's silent prayer. James mentions fervent prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That continual sense of prayer, that continual pleading, that cause or that concern and that burden before the Lord. Not just leaving it uh, once before him and and, uh, with a sort of mindset, well, uh, God, if you want to answer this one, I'll take it or leave it. But having that burden and having that desire for God to truly move. Fervent prayer, that persistent uh, prayer. And even in Romans chapter 8, Paul mentions uh, prayers of groanings. And it's a confusing verse uh, as we come to it. Uh, It's something that we mightn't uh, fully understand. But Paul talks about the Spirit making intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. How he says we don't know how to pray as we ought. And we certainly know that. We're aware of our... Uh, incapability if that's the right word at times whenever it comes to prayer but even then the spirit makes intercession how the spirit undertakes and again there are some of God's people who are maybe a little hesitant to pray in the corporate prayer meeting whether it's uh, out of uh, being uncomfortable or uh, whether it's out of maybe a sense of intimidation Maybe feeling like they don't know the right words to say. They don't know the bigger words that other people might use. And maybe are concerned and feel a little bit uncomfortable about the way their words might come out. Even then, we're comforted to know that the Spirit makes intercession. And someone once illustrated that verse as to say, whenever we do make a muddle of our words, to put it politely. How the Spirit takes that muddle and he makes it presentable to the Lord. You know, whatever it is we pray for and however it is we pray with the best intentions. How we can rest assured knowing that they are brought before the Lord. That the Lord understands everyone. And that he hears everyone. And again, that he will answer even the most hardest prayers of his people. You know, we have a wonderful access this evening. As we come before the Lord in a few moments. We have a wonderful opportunity here this evening. Just to get before him. In prayer. Now not only though is it an open access that we have. But it's a boldness. As Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 3. In whom we have boldness. And access with confidence by faith. Of him. We can come boldly before him this evening. Not just this evening. But in our private prayer. Whatever else it may be. We can come before him boldly. Christ tells us to come before him and call him Abba Father. Such is the intimacy, such is the love that he has for us. That we can call him the same title that Jesus Christ called him in those moments of prayer. Just with this last point, and we'll close this evening. Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know, as much as the spiritual battle might be our own, Paul says here there's still a time and a place to uplift others in their spiritual battles as well. We're still to take those moments to pray for all saints, even to pray for those that we mightn't think have much going on. Again, those saints that have kept their their cares and their burdens to themselves, to pray for them. There's some times where God's people find themselves in such a low point, whether it's Uh, spiritually whether it's mentally they get to such a point that they feel like they can't bring themselves before the Lord that's why Paul tells us to pray for all saints bring them up before the Lord while they feel like they can't we even commanded to do it in Philippians chapter 4 look not every or Philippians chapter 2 rather look not every man on his own things but also on the things of others how we're to pray for all saints how we're to pray for Others, other believers. Again, we take that, that principle from the, even the current ministry of Christ. How he is our advocate. How he prays, not just for us, but he prays for all his people. How he prays for each and every one of his own. You know, again, those wonderful verses in Hebrews chapter 4 and the verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest... That's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. 
but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, it's not always us that need the need. Yes, we do have our needs and concerns. But we're to bring the needs and the concerns of others before the Lord as well. You know, we thought of Peter being in prison and how the disciples were corporately gathered together. It says earlier on in Acts chapter 12, Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They prayed for Peter. And the Lord did wonderful things in Peter's life. Do you bring others before the Lord? Do you bring others before him? Do you pray for all saints? Do you pray for those believers in the fellowship? Even on face value, it seems like there's nothing really going on with them. Some of God's people know it's very easy to put on the mask on a Sunday morning. There might be a lot going on. Do you pray for all saints? We have a wonderful opportunity this evening. Stephen just said before we came in, the prayer list never seems to be getting smaller. There's always another name, it seems, every week. Here we have a wonderful opportunity to do so. You're not just thinking of our own days of spiritual battle, as important as they are to us, but how we can uplift others before the throne as well. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this evening for his dear name's sake. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Father and our God, we're thankful for your word this evening and for this, this month of studies even that we've had as well. Father, we're, we're thankful for help given and for your presence uh, being one of our number as we've gathered together. Father, as we face uh, these dark and these difficult days, we find ourselves truly in days of battle, both internationally and even personally as well. Father, we all have our burdens. We all have our concerns. We all have those moments of doubt, those moments of trial and temptation. And so, Father, we pray that uh, with what we've studied uh, over the last few weeks, uh, we be able to boldly, stand against the wilds of the devil not in our own strength not in our own understanding but truly relying on that spiritual armor truly relying on uh, that rock that is higher than i to be able to stand against our enemy father uh, as we looked at a few weeks ago our, our enemies already defeated how you've already made a show of principalities and powers uh, con- triumphing uh, triumphing openly over them father we're, fa- we're fighting a defeated foe He's just trying to do as much damage as he can. Father, we pray that we can rely on you whenever those moments do arise. And Father, we pray we will know great blessing and progress as we find ourselves in these days here below. Tarry with us as we spend these moments around the throat of grace and prayer. Father, may we even hear new voices. Father, even those who who feel so burdened and, and concerned. Lord, we just pray we'll be able to bring all things before you. And tarry with us, for we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.